Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is our second lecture, Parasitology in the Blood and Lymphatic System block. I am Magda Nazir with you, and this lecture is concerning blood parasites, which are the parasites we can see in a blood. And these parasites also are characterized by being the whole life cycle in blood. The first of them is human malarial parasites. We should know about them, their types, their distribution around the world, also the mode of infection, what occurs when man is infected and we call this the pathogenesis of malarial parasites. Also, after we know the disease process, we must know the diagnosis and the clinical phenomena related to malaria and how to treat and manage the cases of malaria if they are in an epidemic or not. And if anyone comes to our country having malaria, we must know how to deal with the case. Also, in our country, there are sporadic foci for malaria and how can we control this disease in our country is very important. Human malarial parasites belong to plasmodium or genus plasmodium. The species affecting men are more than four, but the main four species are Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium malariae, and Plasmodium ovale. These occur in tropical and subtropical regions, or we call them the tropical regions, mainly Sub-Saharan Africa, Oceania, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central America, and South America. This is a map showing the human malarial parasites distribution around the world. This is the line of the equator. بنقول عليه بالعربي خط الاستواء زي ما احنا شايفين كل الملاريا تقريبا around the equator. Uh, the red parts are concerning many mixed species of malaria while the green parts are concerning plasmodium vivax only. Plasmodium vivax is here mixed with other types of malaria but it can be present alone in temperate climates as we see. The transmission of plasmodium species is primarily by the female Anopheles, which is the only and main transmitter of malaria. Infection with malarial parasites can also occur via vertical transmission, which is rare from mother to fetus, and usually occurs during labor with the rupture of the placenta and mixture of the fetal and maternal blood together. Also, it can occur by blood transfusion. Life cycle of malaria begins with the sporozoids, the infective stage when they are injected during blood meal of Anopheles inside the human blood. They all go to the liver cells, invade liver cells to multiply, forming the exoerythrocytic cycle which begins with the sporozoid staying in blood uh, in hepatic cells forming trophozoites then schizoids then merozoites the merozoites burst out the hepatic cells some of them may stay dormant inside the liver cells which we call the hypnozoites the hypnozoites 
these are dormant cells which are present in the hepatocytes or liver cells and they stay undeveloped waiting for forming relapse after the disease is cured this relapse is only for plasmodium vivax and plasmodium ovate the other types don't have hypnozoids then the merozoids escaping from the liver cells infect the red blood cells and cause the disease which we call the erythrocytic cycle the erythrocytic cycle results every time in merozoids which infect other erythrocytes repeating the cycle when the army is prepared it goes to invade other people so the merozoids then transform into what we call gametocytes the gametocytes engulfed by anopheles during blood meal they transform inside the stomach of mosquito to macro and micro gametes by meiotic division meiotic division results in half the chromosomes when the micro and macro gamete reunite again they form the zygote which transforms into oocyst by penetrating the wall of anopheles stomach and waiting outside under the membrane of the stomach to form oocyst then sporocyst full of sporozoids which burst into sporozoids which collect in the salivary gland of mosquito waiting for the next blood meal this is a diagram of the life cycle of malaria beginning here with the sporozoids injected into the human skin they pass with cir circulation into the liver cells you see here it is growing then growing more to form chizon the chizon ruptures the liver cell and the merozoites go outside here to the erythrocytes forming first the ring stage then the trophozoite amoeboid trophozoite then the chizon the chizon then burst the erythrocytic cell to repeat the cycle again some merozoites we say transform into macro and micro gametes the macro gamete is the female gamete and a gametocyte and the micro sorry these are gametocytes inside the circulation when engulfed by mosquito the gam female gametocyte transforms into macro gametocyte while the male gametocyte transforms into many micro gametocytes by a process called exflagellation one of the micro gametocytes fertilizes the macro gametocyte to form the zygote the zygote then penetrates the wall of stomach to form oocyst then sporocyst the sporocyst bursts into elongate spindle shaped sporozoids which pass to the salivary gland of mosquito to re-enter the human body in another patient or another host now we come to the clinical presentation of malaria clinical presentation of malaria is somewhat different according to the species and we discuss it now but beginning we find it is like a flu like prodrome or prodromal period which is about one to two weeks in it there will be 
repetition of the erythrocytic cycle till the cycle is established. There begins the paroxysms of malaria, which are characteristic for malaria. The paroxysms of malaria are high spiking fever, maybe 40 degrees centigrade or more, and shaking chills due to the high fever, and synchronous systemic lysis of RBCs relieving the excretory material of the um, uh, plasmodium as well as the malarial pigment. This lasts for several hours with sweating and chills. Then the patient has rigors. The rigors are very vigorous and then it, he, the, the, the temperature subsides again and he falls into a long sleep. This paroxysm is repeated according to the species of the plasmodium, as we'll say as follows. This in plasmodium vivax and plasmodium ovale, chills and fever occur every 48 hours, meaning the every third day. So we call it tertian malaria. In case of plasmodium malaria, which is lazy, or rather lazy than plasmodium vivax and plasmodium ovale, it occurs every 72 hours, every fourth day, so we call it quartan malaria. In case of plasmodium falciparum, plasmodium falciparum, there is less predictable fever interval and can be highly variable. So we call it malignant tertian or subtertian malaria. We call plasmodium falciparum malignant malaria because sometimes we can find that there is no paroxysm and so it is subtertian and sometimes it has high fever with very severe complications later. Here are some blood films showing malarial parasites. We can see them inside the RBCs. Here is plasmodium vivax and plasmodium malaria. The ring stage is very big while it is very small in plasmodium falciparum. Um, here is the characteristic band-shaped trophozoite of plasmodium malaria. This is the schizont of plasmodium vivax. This is a trophozoite of plasmodium vivax, which enlarges the red blood cell. Here are the gametocytes of plasmodium falciparum, and hence its name, because these are considered banana shape or falciform gametocytes, so we call it falciparum. This is the microgametocyte, which is light in color, while the macrogametocyte is darker in color. The fever may be accompanied by abdominal pain, diarrhea, myalgia, and cough. Hepatosplenomegaly and thrombocytopenia with leukocytosis may occur. Also, hepatosplenomegaly is characteristic for plasmodium falciparum. Why are the reticuloendothelial cells proliferating in spleen and liver and they cause enlargement of liver and spleen? which is mild enlargement, not huge enlargement as that of Leishmania. This is because the, um, this is because the, uh, the reticuloendothelial cells proliferation is to engulf the dead red blood cells 
and also the malarial pigment and malarial excretory products. 90% of patients infected with plasmodium falciparum are ill within 30 days. The plasmodium falciparum has many complications as we'll see later, but relapsing malarial attacks may occur after many months of cure due to reactivation of the dormant hypnozoids in the liver cells of either plasmodium ovale or plasmodium vivax. In case of plasmodium falciparum and plasmodium malari, there will be hiding erythrocytic stages inside the spleen, causing very low parasitemia, which may revive later and cause what we call recrudescence and not relapse. The complications caused by plasmodium falciparum are very common and most lethal. These are central nervous system involvement in the, in the form of cerebral malaria, which causes convulsions and coma, severe anemia, acute kidney injury, acute respiratory distress syndrome, primarily responsible for fatal disease. Also, plasmodium malaria has complications causing nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome for plasmodium malaria is caused by deposition of large molecular weight plasma proteins, which, or, uh, which are immune complexes formed due to the infection with plasmodium malaria. The nephrotic syndrome of plasmodium malaria can occur in any age of diagnosis and investigation for malaria. We must have to detect the parasite in blood smear either by thick blood film and GIMSA stain for presence of organism then we must have thin blood film with GIMSA stain also for species identification according to the red blood cell morphology and quantification of parasites. And also we can differentiate according to the deposition of some metabolic products inside the cytoplasm of red blood cell as we'll see in the practical part. There is also rapid antigen detection tests, which are useful in malarial surveys. This is a picture of one of the rapid tests, which shows that if there is infection with plasmodium falciparum or plasmodium falciparum and other plasmodium, then this for negative cases. Treatment of malaria, we use basically the chloroquine products. In case of plasmodium vivax and plasmodium ovale, we use chloroquine and primaquine to eradicate liver forms and prohibit relapses. In case of plasmodium vivax, chloroquine resistant cases can have autovacune, proguanine and primaquine or quinine and doxycycline and primaquine. Um, in case of plasmodium malaria, chloroquine is sufficient for treatment and this other parasite, which is rare infection for human. Also, we have for plasmodium falciparum, there is chloroquine resistance, and we'll check there the local resistance pattern, and we give accordingly the anti-malarial drugs. For 
for chloroquine resistant patients, we have some drugs here. They will be discussed for you in pharmacology, but we can list them here, which are artemisinin and doxycycline and with clindamycin or otovacone. Also, we have otovacone and proguanil combination, which is called malarone. Also, we have quinine, doxycycline or clindamycin and mefloquine and artemisinin resistance increasing in Southeast Asia. So we'll have also to check local resistance. And this is because every time the parasite causes mutations which are uh, the parasite undergoes mutations which are resistant to the usual prevention of malaria with anti-malarial prophylaxis in the uh, for the people who are going to malarial endemic areas also covering exposed skin from the bites of mosquito using bed nets here is one and also using insect repellents malaria is the most common fatal infectious disease worldwide because we can't control it till now now we come back to the other types of hemoflagellates which we studied Leishmania as one of them in the previous lecture. Um, these, as we said before, have kinetoplast and flagella for motility, and they are transmitted by insect vectors. We must know the types of human parasitic species, identify the species, their localities, vectors also, we must have basic knowledge on the clinical disease and how it occurs. Also, we must have good knowledge about diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of each case. Now we come to trypanosomes. Genus trypanosoma is divided into two main categories, African trypanosomes and American trypanosomes. African trypanosomes are either Trypanosoma gambiense and Trypanosoma rhodesiense. They have the disease causing sleeping sickness. Sleeping sickness is a disease confined to Africa, and the vector is the tsetse fly, as the natives call it, and the scientific name of it is Glossina. American trypanosomes are only one species which affect human is Trypanosoma cruzi. It is causing Chagas disease. Chagas, according to the uh, doctor who treats this disease many times and was very famous for treating trypanosomiasis in America. So its name, his name is Ernesto Chagas, so they call it Chagas disease. The vectors of American trypanosomes are redovid or triatomid bugs, which are also confined to Latin America. Um, trypanosomes occur in blood and tissue fluids extracellular not like malaria, which is intracellular inside the RBCs and hepatocytes. Trypanosoma cruzi proliferates only as an intracellular amastigote form in some muscles, especially the heart. Concerning African trypanosomes, these occupy the tropical Africa zone under 
uh, or what we call sub-Saharan belt, where their vectors are present. They comprise two main types, Trypanosoma brucei gambiensi and Trypanosoma brucei rudziensi. Both have the same life cycle and morphology, but they differ in many aspects, as we'll see. Distribution Trypanosoma brucei gambiensi is in Western Central Africa, while the Trypanosoma rudisiensi is East and Central Africa. Their vectors also are Glossina palpalis and the other is Glossina morsitans. Also, we have the reservoirs for the disease. Trypanosoma gambiensi is mainly a human disease, while that of Trypanosoma brucei rudisiensi is having animals as reservoirs in open forest. لما الناس تروح السياحة بتاعت السفاري في أفريقيا they may have the disease of Trypanosoma brucei rudisiensi or African sleeping sickness. The disease course in case of Trypanosoma gambiensi is chronic while it is acute, rapid, and fatal course in Trypanosoma rudisiensi. The clinical signs for the western sleeping sickness is chancre, winter bottom sign prominent, stupor, sleepy, coma develop gradually, while the chancre is less prominent and also winter bottom sign but there is high fever, pneumonia, heart failure, coma, which may be fatal. The cause of this in case of Western sleeping sickness or Trypanosoma gambiensi is secondary infection during stupor and coma. Also, some accidents because the patient walks sleepy. Also, usual course of the disease which is ending with deep sleep, coma, and death. In case of Trypanosoma rudziensi, severe pneumonia, acute heart failure are usually causing death in the infected persons and the usual course of the disease which is very rapid and the severe coma occurs and it is fatal. This is a map showing the distribution of Trypanosoma brucei gambiensi, the red one, and Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiensi, which is the blue one. You see, they are in the tropical area between the zones of cancer and ما بين مدار السرطان ومدار الجدي بس زي ما بنقول عليهم عادي كده انه الديستريبيوشن بتاع التريبانوسومز ما بين مدار السرطان فوق ومدار الجدي تحت تمام دلوقتي بقى this is the life cycle for trypanosomes, humans, when introducing the infection by the metacyclic forms from the tsetse fly bite, they develop into trypomastigotes, which invade blood, lymph, and cerebrospinal fluid, replicate there, then the blood meal is taken by the fly ingestion of trypanosomes. When the trypanosomes are ingested inside the gut of the tsetse fly, this one, they are transformed into epimastigotes. And 
they replicate in the gut of the fly as epimastigotes for a while, then go to the salivary glands and transform into what we call metacyclic trypomastigotes. The metacyclic trypomastigotes are the infected stages which are injected with saliva into the blood of the, the host with uh, of the next host sorry uh, a characteristic a characteristic feature for glossina is this shape on its wing concerning the clinical disease it has two stages a stage of the parasite outside the brain and the other stage is invasion of CNS. In the first stage, there is beginning chunker, is replication of the typomastigotes under the skin, causing ulceration of the skin, which we call trypanosomal chunker. Then a stage of parasitemia when the parasites invade the circulation and replicate in the circulation as trypomastigotes. Then they go to the lymph nodes and this causes enlargement of the lymph nodes, especially the posterior cervical lymph nodes are prominent and can be seen, which is called winter bottoms sign. Winter bottoms sign, this is a characteristic and pathognomonic sign for African trypanosomiasis. This is also accompanied by remittent fever. Remittent fever because when the parasitemia is high, there is fever. The parasitemia is low, there is no fever. So we call it remittent fever. Some days with fever and some days without fever. There is also anemia, leukocytopenia, also high immunoglobulin M due to the acute disease. There is rash in white patients and positive Crandall's sign. This, we, uh, this you know it inshallah in neurology section. Also, there is heart involvement jaundice, pneumonia, according to the affection of the myocardium, the liver, and the lung, in case of trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense, which may be fatal. Then stage two, where there is invasion of the central nervous system with gradual loss of consciousness and coordination. The parasites pass to the cerebrospinal fluid, invade the ventricles of the brain and invade the brain matter and replicate in the brain matter among the brain cells and tract so they cause damage and inflammatory reaction resulting in gradual loss of consciousness and loss of coordination. This occurs very rapidly in Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense and very slowly in Trypanosoma brucei gambiense. I said during discussing the clinical disease that there is remittent fever. If there are high parasitemia and the parasites are present in abundance in the circulation, well, there will be high fever, which subsides with lessening of the trypomastigotes in the circulation. This occurs due to what we call wavy parasitemia. What is wavy parasitemia? Some of the parasites, ha the parasites have surface antigen on their cell coat. This, these surface antigens are varying every while to avoid the immune reaction of the patient. So some of 
the parasite change their surface antigen form so they in a few number of its population the new different ones replicate after antigen antibody destruction of the old population so we have wavy parasitemia kegel antibodies against the trypanosomes and kill many trypanosomes except those who have changed their surface antigen they are few in a while they replicate and cause high parasitemia then there is build of antigen against them uh, antibodies against them so this is a repeated every time causing wavy parasitemia but the parasite doesn't end inside the human body diagnosis is according to the stage of disease we can do chancre aspirate in early stages lymph node aspirate and then blood smears all of these can show the trypomastigotes also if we suspecting that there is sleeping sickness we can have cerebrospinal fluid samples in the cerebrospinal fluid we'll have high cellularity and characteristic if we don't see the trypomastigotes there is characteristic what we call um, the morula cell of mott the morula cell of mott is pathognomonic and characteristic for trypanosomes in africa we can do serology for antigen antibody detection the easiest and commonest test in serology is card agglutination test we put some kit on a card dark color and we put the serum of the patient when agglutination occurs means this is positive for trypomastigotes uh, also molecular methods are used in some cases but the card agglutination test is very common and also we can do detection of the parasite easily in the circulation except in the periods of low parasitemia which need further investigation treatment for stage one without invasion of the brain we can give suramine or pentamidine for stage two which has cerebrospinal invasion we'll have melarzoprol or mel b and eflornithine or dmfo both can cross the blood brain barrier and have marked side effect nifortimox which is a new drug called lampet is used in combination with dfmo in melzarzoprol resistant patients and it can also lessen the side effects of eflornithy um, concerning epidemiology and prevention it is mainly concerned with set supply control they breed near the water canals and infect people and animals coming for water animals are reservoirs for trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense only this is used also in patients and in prophylaxis for the disease uh, they say that sepsis flies only bite the moving objects who, who have dark colors like the animals or the natives of the region so if we cover them with more likely paler colors like green or khaki they won't see them and won't bite them 
this is cause this the cause that people and natives there wear lighter colors also if the animals are the reservoirs for trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense to the natives and the people in the campaigns there in africa they surround their their houses with animal sheds or animal um, yeah, animal uh, rooms so the tsetse fly bites the animals first and doesn't come near the houses now we come to american trypanosomes or trypanosoma cruzia trypanosoma cruzi is found in mexico south america and central america transmission is by redovid insect vector or kissing bug or cone nose bug as they call it which defecates on the skin the metacyclic trypanosomes and the metacyclic trypomastigotes in their stool are rubbed into the bite wound when the host scratches after their bite this is called posterior station transmission while the parasites injected by saliva they are called anterior station transmission this is characteristic for trypanosoma cruzi also trypanosoma cruzi is transmitted by, via placental transfer meaning it can be a congenital disease also organ donation blood transfusion and ingestion of contaminated food containing redovid insects which fall inside the juices especially cane juice they depend on concerning the life cycle the life cycle begins with introduction of the infective forms by feces of triatomic bugs blood transfusion laboratory culture handling and also congenital infection and transplantation organ transplantation the trypomastigotes circulate in blood for a while then they invade tissues and multiply as a mastigotes inside the reticuloendothelial cells and also the muscles especially the heart muscle some of the trypomastigotes are still present in blood and when the triatomid bug takes a blood meal they go to it and multiply in the gut of the bug then collect in the hind gut as metacyclic trypomastigotes which are the infective stages this is here the redovid or we call it the triatomid bug they call it cone nosed bug because its anterior end is elongate like this here is the characteristic early infection sign which is rumena sign rumena sign rumena's sign is swelling of is palpebral swelling and swelling of the cheek this is characteristic for trypanosoma cruzi and occurs because when the bite of the uh, the fly is here or the bug is here the trypomastigotes are rubbed into the conjunctiva they replicate under the conjunctiva causing the swelling of the eye and tearing and the pain in this area which we call rumena's sign this is the picture of the trypomastigote and in the laboratory section you have studied this morphology 
already. Then we must have also a close picture to the cardiac muscle and we see that epi uh, that uh, the amastigotes of trypanosoma cruzi replicating inside a cardiac muscle cell. Clinical presentation of American trypanosomiasis are acute, chronic indeterminate, and chronic determinant or final stage of the disease. The acute stage usually is asymptomatic, but there may be local swelling at the site of inoculation, which we call Romana's sign, usually around one eye, with variable fever, lymphadenopathy, myocarditis, and hepatosplenomegaly. This is the early stage of the disease when the parasite invades tissues. Next is the chronic indeterminate phase is asymptomatic period, but with increasing levels of antibody in the blood because the trypomastigotes are replicating as a mastigot inside the tissues. Most infected persons, about 70% remain in this phase and don't go further, but the some of them develop the determinate form of Chagas disease. The chronic determinate form leads to chronic dilated cardiomyopathy, esophagomegaly, and megacolon in 10 to 25 years after acute infection. This occurs in about 30% of infected individuals. Diagnosis of Trypanosoma cruzi. Firstly, we can demonstrate the parasite by many ways. We can have wet preparation, which is the drop of blood is put inverted uh, under the microscope and we examine the blood for motile trypomastigotes. This is helpful and rapid and doesn't need any staining procedures or further dealing with. The other is GIMSA stain of thick and thin blood smears to detect the trypomastigotes. We can also do lymph node aspirate, liver biopsy, and these are, in this we can see the amastigot form of the parasite. Serology and PCR are helpful, but they are too costly for the natives who are poor. So they do something else, which is xenodiagnosis. Xenodiagnosis means that we must have clean triatomid bugs. What clean? Not the washed one, but the ones who don't have parasites. Because once the winged bug is infected, it still and stays infective all its lifespan. So we must have uninfected or clean winged bug. This we make it bite the person and then we we, we uh, dissect it after one week to see the metacyclic trypomastigotes. Treatment and prevention. In acute stage, we'll use nifortimox or benzimidazole in the intermediate yet or indeterminate stage, we'll use also antiparasitic drugs, especially in children 
and adults under age of 50 years. In the chronic determinant, we have only symptomatic therapy like surgery and as necessary, including heart transplant, esophagectomy, and colectomy for the people who have mega esophagus and mega colon. There may be a benefit for antiparasitic treatment in the early stages, which may subside and the colon and esophagus return and heart return to their nearly normal size. Insect control is necessary and also avoiding bites by using bed nets is also necessary for control of the Now we come to the end and these are some question examples which would benefit you in revising and in recollecting the knowledge I have given to you and I wish you all the luck in this block and also if you need any further questioning or any further information you can get my email from the block coordinator Professor Dr. Atimad Yassin in the pathology department. Thank you and good luck again.